you've lost the feeling from like waist down but this wasn't something that you were born with this is something that happened to you do you remember the day clearly do you remember exactly what was happening i've never really disclosed the story like in all of its glory really i explain it as my legs started filling up with concrete and i could not move them i couldn't pick them up i couldn't move them i couldn't do nothing uh, and before I notice it, it's just starting going up. This feeling's going further and further up my body. You're a guy that was very much into sport. Let's talk about your sport. You're a powerlifter. I will be a Paralympic champion. There's not one fibre of my mind that doubts that. You don't know how strong you are until being strong is your only choice. And I think that's something I've carried through my whole journey. How would you deal with starting your life out as a normal person and then suddenly out the blue becoming paralysed? That's exactly what happened to my next podcast guest, Liam McGarry. We speak about going through the adversity, having suicidal thoughts, but then turning his thoughts into something bigger, something stronger. He's now a competitor, an athlete, and he's going to the 2024 Paralympic Games. Be happy, never contend, and make sure you're commenting and subscribing. Before we start, this week's podcast, I have to give a special mention to our sponsors. I Secure Vehicles. They are a brilliant company, a family-run business, and they specialize in vehicle safety and security throughout the UK. I know this company very well, and I also know the people behind the brand. If you've been following me on my podcast journey and on social media, you will know that I love cars and so does my network. This is why I'm very, very excited to be working with iSecure Vehicles, and this is why we have chosen them to be our sponsors for the Stephen Sully Study Podcast. Their team are professionals, experts, and they're efficient. Once their product is installed on your car, your vehicles, you will have the peace of mind that your asset is protected. Trust me, do not wait until it's too late Get protection now. For more information about their products, including dash cameras, undetected immobilizers, and also car tracking systems, head over to isecure-vehicles.co.uk. And remember to mention the Stephen Sully Study podcast sent you. Right, welcome back to the podcast, Stephen Sully Study, here at my second home, Woodbury House over in Mayfair. I've got a brilliant guest in front of me and a phenomenal story. It's a story of some downs, but mostly ups. It's a story about mindset. It's a story about positivity and it's a story about pursuing your dreams no matter what happens to you. So Liam McGarry, thank you very much for your time. Welcome to the gallery and looking forward to this episode. Hello, how are you doing? You okay? It's been, uh, yeah, thank you for having me on. Yeah, no worries. Uh, it's been class looking around the, the gallery this morning. I was going to ask you, actually, um, I don't know how much interest you got in art. I don't know how many galleries you've been to, Liam, but your first initial gut feeling of, on the building and also the artwork? Uh, yeah, as, as I probably uh, class myself as an absolute novice when it comes to art, to be honest. Um, never really something that I've, I've ever been massively into, but the professional vibe that I got when I walked in the place just sort of hit me in the face. And it was sort of like, I knew I knew I was somewhere of, of, of good prestige. It was like, I mean, it, even for my terms, it's like what I'm doing is getting me invited to places like this. It's quite, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a sign that I'm going in the right direction. Absolutely, mate, absolutely. Um, I want to talk about all your accolades and what you're doing right now, you know, smashing records, competing, training and all that good stuff. But I feel it's only right for the audience to understand your journey as a young man going through certain scenarios, come out, coming out the other side and learning a lot of lessons. And there's a bit of advice there. But so anyway, in short, um, You've lost the feeling from like waist down, but this wasn't something that you were born with. This is something that um, happened to you not even really too long ago as well. So let, let's take it right from, from the start then. Um, you're, a, you're, you're a guy that was very much into sport, yeah. football, rugby. You yeah. went to Bournemouth University to study, if I got here, sports, psychology, coaching, sciences. Yeah. Is yeah. that correct? 
Um, yeah, tell me a bit more about your, your sports interests and, and why was you such a, a lover of sports, specifically football and also rugby? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I think it was in me from a kid. I think I first kicked a football when I was like two years old. I, I remember there was a club um, that was local to me called Fleet Down, and I remember I was like two years old playing in the under fours, under fives, like, which, and I just loved it from the minute. And I think as I've grown older, the thing, I, the euphoria or, and the um, the feel good factor of competing is unrivaled to me. And Growing up, I always wanted to win. Like I was just, I wanted to win at every single thing I do, even if it was like having an argument with, uh, in a, the most about the most trivial things. I and I knew I was wrong. I'd go to the hill with it because I just couldn't stand losing. And I think that was in me from from when I was so young. And obviously, my sporting journey started in football. Um, I played county district, played at a couple of pro clubs throughout my time. But I was always, and I was always one of the better players in the, the clubs and the leagues that I played in. But I never got that break, so to speak. And um, I, ro I rolled with the punches of Captain London County. Um, then I got to I got got to under 18 level, and I in the same season I won the county league with London. I won the Kent Youth League, the Kent Cup, and just we just cleaned up trophy wise while I was playing at Cray Valley at the time. And it was off and I left there and then I went into full-time football, so to speak, at Dartford FC, which at the time were in the conference, which is now the National League. And it was about after six months of being there that I just like completely started falling out of the love with the game. Um, and my love for sport probably made me underachieve in, in other walks of my life. So it got to a, a place where, in a sense, sport was all I had left. Uh, in terms of like, I left, I didn't do so well at school. I was in and out of different schools before I left completely, I think in that like year nine or year 10, because I just wanted to kick a football. I just wanted to play sport. So I ended up leaving and I was working on building sites, um, just laboring because when, when I got, when I left, when I got kicked out from school, left school, my mum um, turned around to me and said, look, you're my son, like, I'll always love you, but you're out of this house at eight o'clock on Monday morning. You're not going to be a, a dosser, so to speak. You're not going to sit here and do nothing. So on that Monday, um, the Monday come along and I went I went and done some labouring and this was while I was playing at Dartford. And I saw, uh, towards of my first year at Dartford, it, it, people were getting picked ahead of me that weren't better than me. And I see like the the politics of football just made me sort of fall out of love with it at a rapid rate. And I ended up leave, leaving football altogether and, and just working on the building site. So at this point, uh, you're probably thinking like, Jesus, you can't go much lower. But I was earning my money, I was doing my thing. And then I was working on a house in Welling one day and um, and I was chopping these breezy blocks from about six o'clock in the morning and it got to about nine o'clock at night. And I'm still, I've got this big light on me and I'm still chopping breeze blocks. And I f launched the saw into the ground and I, walk, I, I walked home. And then on that Monday, I, I enrolled in a college and, and, and that's where um, my journey from playing sport to the next best thing for me was I wanted to go into coaching it. So I, I've done, I'm i now a UEFA B licensed football coach. I've done plenty of coaching badges that I don't use anymore. <laughs> and I went into coaching it. So that's when my journey started. I'd done... I had to go the long way because I didn't get my GCSE. So I ended up doing three years of college and, and night school and everything to get me into Bournemouth University. And whilst I was doing that, I was doing my coaching badges. And then obviously started at Bournemouth University. Um, and, but whilst I was at college, there was a teacher there called Ian Harmon. And because I was a bigger set lad, it, it was from the minute I walked into them college gates every single day, Big man, we need to get you on a rugby team. Big man, we need to get you on a rugby team. Have you ever played rugby? Have you tried rugby? And I'm going, nah, 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 I'm not interested, not interested. And after a few months, I was like, do you know what? I need to get this geezer off my back. Like, I'll do it. He's, he's come running up to me in a lunch canteen one day and he said, like, we're struggling for players. We've got no players. I need you there. I need you to just fill a number, basically. And I, I was like, all right, I'll do it. And we went down to um, 
Folkestone and we had it like it was an inter college thing and I ended up getting player of the day and, and, and selected to travel with England colleges and this is like probably like my third or fourth game of rugby in my life but it was just that fight that aggression that wanting to win and being the size I was then I, it was almost like and I remember sitting there on a coach home when I got given the ball to say I was mad and I was sitting there like why well, haven't I not done this years ago? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it, it just went from there, really. And then I went to Bournemouth University, got into the first, uh, first the starting squad straight away, and uh, and yeah, and, that, and that was that was my sport, really. It was I was football, football, football. I still am football mad now, but I was football, 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 and then transitioned to rugby shortly before uh, I had my injury. So on. So if you were to be given a choice today football or rugby which one is it football if um, because you know what the thing one of the things I miss the most like I used to be like big in my own trumpet up here but I used to be unreal at five side football like you like, and that's what I miss the most just a bit of football a bit of five yeah. side do you know like even like a lot of my mates live in Clapham now and when we go go over to Clapham Common and they're booting footballs around and I'm just sitting there like I've even done it before where I've like the balls roll towards me and I've gone to kick it and I'm like realise I can't and my legs just not moved anywhere. Um but yeah, if I could football day, I'm a I'm a season to go to West Ham now, so I'm up there all the time and yeah, I can't like people that didn't know me pre injury, like they struggle sometimes to comprehend how much football means to me. Mm. Uh, especially like my teammates and, and some people in the professional set and they're like God, it's only a game and I'm like, ah, oh, no, it ain't, it's not, it's not. But yeah, if I could go back to one, it'd be definitely be football. Um, I found an article from The Mirror, and you've probably seen it, 22nd of June, 2017, this is what it says. Student becomes paralysed from waist down while travelling uh, to summer ball on double-decker bus. And it, it goes on to say that he was on the top deck and you felt, some pains going through your leg and during the day your you, your legs gave way and almost collapsed a few times but you put it down to dehydration and when you went over a bump and there was a shooting pain you kind of knew at that point it was there was something something wrong before obviously this podcast we spoke a day or so ago and um you mentioned to me that potentially from from the rugby uh from from uh, from being taken out maybe um that could have caused some sort of problems which led on to which led on to this so talk to me about being on that bus what what do you remember the day clearly do you remember exactly what was happening do you remember where you were sitting walk me through that journey yeah i think probably the one of the most harrowing things is that i do actually remember every single last bit of it and uh i've never really disclosed the story like in all of its glory, really. I, like my family and friends I do, but this is probably like the first time publicly where I'll, I'll, I'll go into the depths of the ins and outs of it. But I remember it was, it was our end of year summer of all, so I literally had my last exam the day before. Uh, so I finished that, gone shower, and I'm like, this is the summer start. So I, and the first summer at university, like, I'm buzzing. I'm like, everything's gonna take off this summer. and. It was the Six Nations, uh, not the Six Nations, it was the Lions Tour in rugby. And we met in a, in a pub called the Hop and Kildren at like eight o'clock in the morning um, because obviously it was on New Zealand time. So we we're in there at eight o'clock in the morning and end of the season, the season's done, the uni year's done. So we're just in there having a few, a few beers, like the whole rugby cohort was there. And uh, yeah, it's having a few jars had some breakfast and then one of the boys was like right let's go back to because we was all in fancy dress there's a couple of funny stories regarding a fancy dress but um we was all in fancy we've gone back to one of the seniors house ed james his name was and we've all got we've all got into our um our attire and we was going as aboriginals at the time so it's literally like and again i was a, i didn't really have a, a body for buddy smugglers but um i'm standing there with a pair of buddy smugglers on and a, and a stencil of the of the cl rugby club crest on my chest so uh yeah not ideal garms to be uh collapsing in so to speak but uh, anyway we we start walking along and then the pre uh, uh, it's, a, it's a known thing or oh, i don't know whether it still is now but it was when i was there that every summer ball the the main pre drinks or where everyone gets together is in the courtyard of uh of one of the halls called purbeck so as we walk in there 
I've like my legs, I've just started like shuddering, like falling forward. And I was just holding on, like I'm holding on to a wall. And I'm like, what the, what the fuck is that? And I'm holding on to it. And as, as I'm holding on to the wall, like my legs have just, I can't feel my legs at all. And it was like, fuck, like I'm spang in trouble here. And I just had no, I had no idea what was, what was happening or nothing. So I've just stood there, I've sat there, I've held, I've held on, I've held on. And after a, a seconds at, at this point, after a few seconds, my legs have come back. So in my head, I've just been like, well, I'm a bit dehydrated. Let me put a beer down and, and, and let's have some water. And, and I kept walking and no, no problem. And then we get into Purbeck, the halls where the priest is, there's hundreds and hundreds of people there. And me that always fancies myself as a bit of class clown, like to be the funny guy. I'm in the middle of everyone doing the worm. And uh, not a very good worm at that either. I was just trying, attempting to do a worm, trying to be funny. And I remember that I'll never forget the fact that I couldn't finish the worm. And it was three or four times that I tried before, I, before in my head it was like, something's not right here. So I'm doing it, and I'm, I'm just my top half's moving. So then uh, one of the seniors, Danny Kirkpatrick, just pulled me up onto a salt bin and I'm sat on a salt bin at this point and I'm like, this something's not right here. But still being amongst all the boys, being half cart, I was just like, I'll be all right. So now I've sat on a salt bin again. I've, I haven't had no beer since the first episode, so I'm still drinking the water and then it's come back again. So I'm like, oh, it's all right, I'm fine. But at, that, at, at this point, I should have done something there or thereabouts but because uh, a week prior when we was talking about the we had Bournemouth Sevens and I took a big hit on a Sunday and because I was a tough guy the, the one that just got on with it I left the pitch and I was like oh it's just a bit of a dead hip so I was like it's fine mm. everyone's going let's go see physio and like, nah 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 I'm alright I'm good so then fast forward a week all of that's happened and I'm sat on this salt bin and I'm like right what am I doing here and I've just sat and I've let the, the, the boy in me take over and I'm going right let's crack on as soon as it come back, let's crack on with the day. So we've now walked round to the fire station where you get the bus to go to the summer ball. Now, as I've got on the, as I'm getting on the bus, this, uh, one of the security guards has gone like, I don't know if you're going to get in the other end, because I was being a class clown, I was joking about, and I was, and there was a, I think there was at the end of their witch with me on that particular day, and I've gone like, ah, oh, no, nah, don't worry, I'll get on. So I've, I've run to the top of the back of the bus and I've managed to get on and he's not seeing me the bus is pulling away I'm like boom quids in but the thing was I'd let I'd, in order to do that I had to leave all my mates so I'm like to the boys I see you up there and I've just jumped on gone to the back hidden and mm. stay there and then we keep going in and then we drive in and as we come into um, Chapelgate in Bournemouth it's like sort of a road that comes in and you go round and there's like little speed bumps on the way and on one of the, went over one of the speed bumps and I was like, ouch. Like it was like the most excruciating, it was like someone was ripping my spine, like with their hands, either side of my spine and just ripping it sideways, like from the inside out sort of thing. And I explain it as my legs started filling up with concrete. Like they started filling up with concrete and I could not move them, I couldn't pick them up, I couldn't move them, I couldn't do nothing. And uh, and before I noticed it, it's just starting going up. This feeling's going further and further up my body, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. So on the bus, I got them big bars with the stop buttons, and I've tried to pull myself up onto that. And as I've done that, I've just collapsed, and my whole body's just emptied. So everything just shut down. So I couldn't sit up. I couldn't do nothing. My bladder and bowels just left me. Like everything had just completely. And that was when I was like, I'm banging trouble here. Um, but before I pulled it, pulled myself up, I let everyone get off the bus. So I'm laying on the bus, and the bus, like, the bus driver's come up with a security guard, and the security guard looked at Sinis me, and he's gone, "Ah, oh, it's, it's McGarry. He's probably pulling our leg. He's like leaving me. He'll be off in a minute." So they went off. They left me. They left me on the bus. Thought I was joking, laying in the middle of a bus, just like with no. And then anyway, about about ten minutes later, the same geezer come back and was like, "You're not all right." Are you? I was like. No, I'm at, like I'm in in a world of trouble here. I had, but the, the the crazy thing was where I was so worried and so panicked and I had no idea what was going on. I didn't have no pain. Like I had no pain for something that was as serious as what was happening. I had no pain. I was almost numb to it. And then, so yeah, then they cut the top of the the bus off, 
cut the top of the back of the bus off, winched me down on a on like a zip line sort of thing, straight into the back of the ambulance. And then I went off to Paul Hospital and after I was in there for about five minutes, they was like, we can't deal with this. This is too serious for us. And then I got lifted to Southampton. Helicopter. Uh, yeah, yeah, Southampton um, Hospital where where I stayed for about six weeks for getting moved on to a spinal unit at Salisbury. Um, so yeah, obviously being a London boy, I was so far away from home going through all of this. So it was, uh, um, yeah, it was it was a it was a, a whirlwind, so to speak. But I think it's uh, my upbringing, my the, the things I got up to as a kid, like the trouble I got myself into, and things like that, almost set me up to be able to deal with something like this. I just didn't know that at the initial onset. You know what I mean? Mm. So you were diagnosed with I'm going to try and pronounce this trans, transverse myelitis. Yes, transverse myelitis. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and, and in short, what is that? Uh, so it, it's inflammation of the spinal cord, but it's also something, um, and the reason why I made the news and the TV and papers got involved is because it's it's something crazy, like one in 100 million people or something get it. Um, it's like so super rare, and it's almost like they, they they didn't actually know what was wrong with me. This was the only option they had left, sort of thing. And that's because they had done tests for strokes, for cancers, all different things like that, and there was nothing. Um, and they would put me down as a medical mystery. But and then this uh, transverse myelitis popped up a little bit further down the line. Okay. Um, and it's basically yeah, just where your spinal cord um, swells and f uh, inflames and fills out the passage where the nerves go down and it just basically so that's the crazy thing like about it. for the whole time I was in hospital and that the doctors are going yeah you might walk in like you, there's a good chance here because there's actually no trauma no damage that you haven't ruptured you haven't like snapped your back in a, in a sense um it's uh, but yeah it never uh, never materialized like that do you ever sort of think back to the last times that you were uh, walking stepping maybe running like do you ever do you ever think about those days oh, all the time like it is people see what i'm doing now and, and see the headspace i'm in right now but that harrows me every single day of my life like it's it's honestly people don't realize the what i do to be able to do the simple things that they moan about in a, in a sense that Oh, oh, as I said earlier, always thinking about kicking a football. Like when I'm, or when I'm watching my mates doing, and then my, I've I've got incredible friends and family that don't leave me out of nothing. Um, but that's the hardest thing when you sat there watching it and you're like, oh. like I used to get really the boys. I, I this is just an example of it. I used to, I used to coach my all my mates in a sevens team, and they gave me the they gave me the gooner at the end of the first season because I took it so seriously. But it's because I'm playing through them almost. And it was almost like I'm watching some of the things that are going on. Like, I could do that better or I could do that better. And I'm like trying to get through my passion through them. And it, and it, and it, and it just never worked. So they ended up getting rid of me. But yeah, it's like another thing, like thing that's been um, uh, sort of on my mind lately is on, every day I've been noticing my legs are getting smaller. So it's like... Because uh, for me, when I used to play football and all my sport, my legs, I always had the biggest legs. Like, I used to love training my legs and, and it, they were my pride and joy in a sense. Like I weren't ever really bothered about abs or nothing like that, as you can tell. But um, but yeah, that was my thing. And, and that's something that I've got no shame in admitting. I, I do cry about from time to time because I, sometimes I'm putting my socks on and like, my, my hand goes around my whole leg. And it's never been able to do that. Do you know what I mean? It's so, yeah. There's not a day that goes by in my life where I don't think about what was or or what I would be doing now if I was still in that situation. Um, but it's it's almost like I use that to fuel the fire of what I what I am doing now. And it's like I know it's cliche to say, but it's it, that really is. Every time I think about that, I seem to have a better session. Or because I go into that gym fuming, like what? That like, almost like why did that have to happen to me? And, and and it's like the million dollar question, would I take my life now, which is to the outside far better. I'm I'm traveling the world doing whatever I'm doing and or would I take my life just being a normal person, nine to five. And it, it's still be a hard choice for me because 
But the shit, it's the simple things I miss, yeah. It's mm. the simple things. I, I mentioned that there was a former podcast guest I had on, which is, is a different story, but has similar sort of things where normal fit guy, he was also into sport, um, joined the army and was part of the special boat services. So not just a regular army, we're talking about the elite. And this, this Toby went into a compound, got shot in the neck and became paralyzed. Um, I think the difference was he, he got paralyzed from the neck down, so nothing, he can't move anything. Mm. And he needed to be assisted everywhere. And he was talking about many, many years of the depression, the anxiety, the, the, the basically missing his former life. And he, he con contemplated a lot of times, you know, basically committing suicide, taking his own life. And I hate to raise it, but I just, yeah. look, I'm gonna be like, me and my dad talk about it all the time. My dad will show me an article, like someone's lost, I know, like half of their body because of they've been blown up somewhere. And mm. he says, I don't know if I could go for it. I think I would take my own life. Was that ever a thing that went through your mind when you lost lost the, the use of your legs? Yeah, of course. I think um, I'll start off by saying, uh, just in reference to what you said that your dad said, he didn't know whether he could get through it, but I think, um, you don't know how strong you are until being strong is your only choice. Mm. And I think that's something I've carried through my whole journey. I could, because I know what it feels like to be backed in a corner, surrounded by a depression, by not want, by wanting to kill yourself. I remember sitting there with my mum and dad in, in Southampton Hospital. This was just after I'd got lifted there. And I was just, my head was chaos. And I remember saying, like looking them dead in the eye, and it's the most, it's one of the most poignant parts of my whole journey is I looked my dad dead in the eye and I said, as soon as you go, dad, that wire's going straight around my neck. I said, I can't do this. I, c I cannot do this. I can't live like this. I'm not the person who I am like this. And my dad looked me dead back in the eye. He went, if you go, I'll go. And I never, ever forget that. And I've never seen my dad cry. I never, ever, ever seen my dad cry, but he was on the verge of tears this one particular time. And that's how I, it, and that's why I'll always remember it because, I mean, I, I don't know if your dad's the same, but when you've got a, a tough dad, so to speak, like when your dad doesn't show that emotional side of him and he looked me dead in the eye and he said, if you do it, I'll do it. And it was just, yeah, that was just, that was a, one of the most vivid memories I got from my injury because it was like, I couldn't think of a worse thing at that point in my time than waking up the next morning. And that's, and uh, but one of my biggest things um, that I've developed from that is, is solution over excuse. And what I mean by that is, I know, as I said a minute ago, I know what it feels like to be fenced in, caged in by depression, by being in a body you don't wanna be in, by being surrounded by people you don't wanna be surrounded by in terms of doctors, nurses. And ultimately, living an existence that I didn't want to live. And every single day, I was like thinking in different ways. This was right in the early stage. And I feel like it's always the easiest things always to make an excuse for something. And that it come from me that, like, one I hear a lot of the time, and it really gets on my, it really gets on, on my nerves, is when people go, oh, I ain't got time. It's like, what do you mean you haven't got time? And then like, they'll go home and they'll just sit in front of the telly for hours or they're, they're going to do, and I'm like, what do you mean you ain't got time? That's just an excuse. And people become so comfortable with making excuses that it makes them feel better about themselves. And in order for me to improve my self-worth and, and self-confidence and to get that back, I needed to find solutions to what I was doing. It wasn't, because I sat there and, and I actually wrote an Instagram post about this a little while ago. I had to let the, we can do this mindset overrun the all is lost one and 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 that was a fit and uh, it come from it all come from an orange pill um and I've, I've, i say this story everywhere i go because i feel like it's such an incredible story and this was where it was really the the point where i started finding solutions i needed to get back up off because i was at rock bottom that i couldn't go any lower without being dead in my mind um and i had to find ways out of that i had to find a way of improving myself everything, getting rid of doubt. Like I've still got a life to live and it all come from an orange pill. And I, this orange pill was on the side and I looked at it and I couldn't stop looking at it because in that place, it was so easy to press a button and it get done for you. 
And I said, I'm going to get this in the bin. And we go, 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 to, go to the bins. Um, but ironically, on all spinal units where most of them are in wheelchairs, they've got push pedal bins. So I was like, oh, I'm stuffed. I can't do nothing. Because at that time, I couldn't go side to side easily. I couldn't do much. I was brand new injured. Anyway, I just like, I could get my front wheels. Like now I can do a wheelie, go down curves a lot. But I, at the time, I could only do about an inch flick up and bang down. So I'm, I'm sitting there for hours coming up and trying to land it. And eventually I landed on the, on the pedal and I put the orange pill in a bin. And, and from that day forward is when my life become one big challenge. And, and it's easy for people to say, but everything I do now is a challenge. Like even some of my pals will go to me like, my like, guys, why are you so competitive? Like, calm down. And I'm like, this is, everything's bigger for me now. Do you know what I mean? This is my, I call it the comeback. This is my comeback. And I'll never be back to that original self, but I'm going to give it a good, good go of making a life I can be proud of, my, my friends can be, and my family can be proud of. And that all come from that one day where I started it contemplating T killing myself, taking my life, looking at wires to wrap around my neck. Um, and then it ended with me like, to you know what, Pff, fucking bring it on, do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, and then that was, yeah, that was that was a point of it. And it, 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 it don't get me wrong, there's been, um, there's, st there's still times along the way where I had, tw in 2022, I'd put away 16 surgeries. Um, and they weren't like one, I had to, I had to reconstruction of my femur because I snapped my femur and it repaired wrong because I couldn't feel it. I'd snapped it, but not realize I'd snapped it. So it started repairing wrong. Um, I lost a hearing in my right ear because I had my, my my ear taken out of my right ear as a result of something could have called a clostiotoma. And this all happened in one year. So in that- Have you got sound in there now? Uh, no, just in my left side. The right side's permanently done. I've got an implant in there. So I, had, I was having operations on like my leg, my brain, my ear, my bladder, like everything in this year, everything has just gone like, oh, you ain't gone through enough. Let's have a bit more. And in in that year, I remember sitting there like, and I got no shame in admitting it, but like just crying and just being like, I can't do this. Like, I can't do this. But I go back to what I said earlier. It's in them times where you don't realize how strong you are and what you've got the ability to get through, you know, and it's... um. And now I don't think there's anything other than whatever takes me the day I go that I won't get through. And I feel like, I've said it before, like, but you can be, you can, you can out, you can outsmart me, you can out, you can outthink me, you can outspeed me, you can out, you can do whatever you want, but you never outquit me. And, and I think that's my super strength. And I think that's something that I've developed growing up, the way I grew up. Um, and obviously coming into the injury i've just honed in on it and and mastered it tenfold yeah do you know like and that even just choked me up a little bit when you were talking about you know putting the wire around your neck and then your dad looking at you in the eye and saying if you go i go and do you know what i'm not a um psychologist nor have i been around a lot of people that have tried to commit suicide or taken their like, own lives but just with that little sort of sentence that you gave me there it shows that if people are contemplating it it's not just about your own life you're going to take that it's going to be affecting so many other people around you um friends family people that love and adore you and um it sometimes takes in moments to listen to something like that feel someone else's energy and for you to shift your mindset and i think um even though it's a very emotional sad thing to to hear even for me it was probably one of the best bits of feedback that you got. Yeah, a hundred percent. Because as I said, like dad was always so stern with me, like straight to the point, and it's like why I'm like I am now. Um, Mum as well. Mum's no soft touch either. D d growing up, they've always been the same. Um, but yeah, it, it's it was, and it stuck with me, and it and it's like I thought about it, but I never actually tried to or I never got to the point where I was like I'm going to do this tomorrow um, it's like almost playing it out in your mind fantasising over it but obviously not doing the, the next part which is planning and then going ahead yeah yeah 100% because you, you get thrown into such a whirlwind you're like there's actually no point of me being it 
like I'm at that point, I had people by my bed all the day, and I was just like, I'm a burden. Like I hated it. I couldn't. For someone that, like even I'd, I've been independent. Like I was walking myself to school in like the younger years of primary school. Do you know what I mean? Like when everyone used to go in for Christmas and that at uni, I used to stay down. Like I was my own man, and I, and I'd, I'd lost that in that initial sense. Like I've got it all back now, and, and I've got an amazing life now, but. In that initial sense, and going on the people that are thinking about it, it's just like, I guess, I guess my the biggest thing that that I had to do, and I had to train my mind to do, and I had to almost become a non-negotiable was doing the things that were opposite to what my brain was telling to me, telling me to do, um, because. Yeah, I remember sitting in a spinal unit sometimes and, and the thoughts start festering and you start going in and it's just like, oh, you don't need to get up today. You don't need to go outside today. But I knew that's exactly what I did need to do to get out of this, to keep going. And and, and yeah, and we come out we come out the other side after about six months, got through the hospital. And the day I left hospital, I moved straight back into university, didn't go home, didn't take the easy route. Um, obviously, my whole family were like, come home for a bit, like, let's get yourself sorted but that's not how I wanted to do it I wanted to learn on the job go go back to uni and then yeah ended up graduating um, without without submitting a single um, a deadline extension or extreme circumstances application nothing like that and and uh, because again that was one of my non-negotiables at that time was to graduate and finish my uni with the people I started it with you um, you use that phrase quite a lot. I've I've listened to it as you as you're talking, and I've heard that phrase with a lot of self-made people, people that are go-getters, people that are very very determined in life, which is non-negotiable. Why is that such an important phrase for you? Because there's so many there's so many easy excuses, and it drives me crazy. Like, even when I talk to my pals sometimes, and I'm like, right, let's go do this. It's such a performance. And I can't, and it's rather than just going bang, let's do it, it, it it's going all around the house, oh, this person. And there's so many excuses. And, and I think, I feel like with a lot of people, excuses are used to make them feel better about themselves. Agreed. So, because I think, especially in, in the modern day, I think being honest with yourself is, is becoming almost, something that's not celebrated as as much as like it's like the participation awards is like winners aren't being celebrated anymore it's like oh well done you you come 15th out of 16th like it, and, and and i think that's what it is with me like i don't my biggest fear of anything i've ever done is being average and there's two extremes to that so in my sport now there's nothing there's i will do absolutely anything and everything to get to the top of that tree and there's never been a British man in a super heavyweight that's the top of that tree, but I'm on the verge of breaking into that that top that the top hole, and I'm on the verge of of dominating the world and doing things. And there's not a thing that if my, if my boss turns around to me and goes, "We're going to do this," and I go, "Why? Why are we going to do that?" and he explains to me, and I'm I'll do it because there's no no thing. And it, and it even goes back to like the reason the comparison is like in lockdown. I don't know if you come across it, but Call of Duty Warzone come out, and I'd never touched a game in my in my in my life. Uh, Call of Duty, well, I'd only ever played FIFA. And uh, like my pals at the time, they were all Call of Duty and not FIFA. So I was like, I'm jumping in these lobbies and I'm useless. But I remember doing everything I could, and by the end of the lockdown, I was the best of it because I was watching YouTube videos, I was playing, like when everyone's asleep, I'm like, right, this is where I've got to get better, blah, blah, blah. And I'm doing that, and it's, it's every extreme of what I do. I need to be the best, I need to win. I can't stand, like, my biggest fear in my sport is just going to all these nice places and like being a mid-stack athlete, do you know what I mean? It's just like, at the end of the day, it's, it's what it's all about. And, and in order to get to them places, you have to do things that you have to do. You have to do it. Like, it's, it's for example, like if, if all my mates have organised something on a Friday or or whatever, or they're going on holiday, like the amount of holidays and trips away I've missed because it's like, no, I've got to do these things because I'm not going to get to my end goal by not doing these things. And and it becomes a part where you can't not do them. Um, so it's even... 
So like a, a, a thing we, again, I don't know, I posted about it yesterday, but about sleep. Like my sleep since my injury has been awful. And this is, uh, and but I've always, until I sat down with my boss and the doctors at, at Great Britain, I thought I'd always done as much as I could to try and combat it. When about six months ago, when we started cracking down it properly, I realised I was just feeding myself excuses to make myself feel like I had been. So in the last six months, I've made non-negotiables of getting out of bed at the same time every morning, whether I've had an hour sleep or 10 hours sleep or, or three hours sleep. I was out of that bed every time at the same time in the morning. 7.30 in the morning, I was up and all that. Um, and then I, like before that, I'd, oh, if I'd had a bad night's sleep, I'd get up at eight or if, do you know what I mean? And like that. And that become a non-negotiable for me. That, that was one of the ones I carried into the, the, the most recent crop. And it was just these things because and and then I go to the world champs and I smash a competition, sleep the best I've slept in a competition environment. So it's almost like one, I know that if I make them a non-negotiable in my head, no one's going to stop me from doing that. Whereas if I go, oh yeah, yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that. As soon as something better comes up, I'll, I'll go and do that. You know, and it was just one of them things. And it was one of them things that like carried me on. So like one in the hospital, going back to the spinal unit, um, there was an old chap on, uh, in, in one of the bays, his name was Dave Fogden, and the nurses were so overrun. So every morning I had a non-negotiable of being out of bed to go and put his toothpaste on his toothbrush. Do you know what I mean? Little things like that, it just gets me going, it gets me going on the day. It's small wins, because the minute you start them, and I, I, know, I know you've had um, people talking about Conor McGregor on, it, on the pod before, but it's also... Um, in his in his new four part series, he talks about it as well. In when he lost his first fight to um, the American fellow, was assuming I really lost fight. Nate, Nate Diaz. Uh, the one after that, Poirier. Poirier, yeah, yeah. So when he lost that fight, he actually speaks about it in his documentary, and he, he says about like I let my bedtime shift five minutes, and he was like, I've seen it. I, I let yeah. my meal times were if I was saying I was having meal at nine o'clock and I had it at 9.15 and it's like and, and, and I, I couldn't agree more with that because going through my whole injury my recovery doing what I do now there's some things that get done and they're getting done when they get done and, and that's the end of it no amount of plans and, and, it, and again it was the solutions over excuses things right it's easy to, to I don't want to look back at my career and go oh if I'd have done that or I'd have done this do you know what I mean mm. and I think that's my biggest driver of the non-negotiables it keeps you accountable and I feel like I agree with everything you, you say that in today's environment the age of social media guys I wanted to hop on here to once again thank the sponsors of this week's podcast I Secure Vehicles when we were searching around for sponsors for the channel, we honestly wanted to get a brand, a company that will give massive amount of value to our audience. And that is definitely iSecure Vehicles. They have a wide range of products which are designed to keep your vehicle, your asset safe and secure. Some of those products are dash cameras, undetected immobilizers, and car tracking systems. Head over to iSecure to look at their products and make sure you say that the Stephen Sully Study podcast sent you there. I mean, I'm 37, right? Mm. Don't class myself as old, but I'm certainly not like a, a young man anymore. And I'm in this age group where I'm young enough to be using social media still as a kind of a younger person, but I'm actually old enough to, re to remember life without social media. Yeah, yeah. You know, I remember when there was no such thing as Instagram at all. I remember when it first came out and, and some people will listen to this and go, what? They've only ever known life with, with social media. And the blessing and the curse of social media, the blessing is as a podcaster, I can reach out to the George Groves and people like that, which I've got a lot of my podcast from and have a conversation with them. Great. And speak to my friends and stuff. Downside to it is these narratives start to flow through social media and I feel like it's, you know, you touched on a couple of things where the excuse making, you know, or putting someone into a bracket saying like, well, this is the reason why they can't do X, Y, Z because this, they're, they're, this is their profile. And then it's like the snowflake era, you know, the moment that you say something a bit too direct, it is perceived as being aggressive or is a bit 
being perceived as too masculine or too feminine or whatever and before you know these people have you know they, they've got a complaint the reality is nothing in life gets done unless you really commit and mm. keep yourself accountable and i think going back to the raw the raw principles of life if you want to be, be become a success that's the only real way you're going to get from here to here so you mentioned like conor mcgregor is a conor mcgregor type person one of your biggest kind of not heroes but someone that you look up to like a role model or is there somebody else that you look up to and you think yeah they're, they're a role model for me um like i wouldn't say conor mcgregor is quite a role model um i like the way i like the way he is because he's unapolog unapologetically himself isn't he and and i feel like definitely in my domain and my and my sport i'm exactly the same like i am who i am i'll, I'll do my best i i'll i'll, I'll toe the line in a, in a professional environment but i am who i am I'm, I'm a loud guy i like to be funny i like to do these things and it's and it's but if i i in terms of like sporting idols um I've never really had idols, so to speak. Like, but one one person that made me turn a switch, I, it was actually Anthony Joshua, because I was in a um, I was in a I was in at Loughborough University where he where he done his camp for the Usyk, first Usyk fight, uh, for the, both the Usyk fights actually, and he done his camp, and we were standing in the same hotel, and. Um, just like, and what people see of AJ is like on the cameras and things like that. And so many people got a, an opinion of him that's actually so far away from what he's actually like. And when I was spending all this time with him through, through his camps, just watching how he conducts himself, what he puts in his body, what what time he does this, when he's playing like FIFA or we're in the games room and he's got like infrared on the recovery. And, and he was always doing something that contributed to that end goal and it was like and I remember sitting there this like, and I remember sitting there and, and I remember thinking like, I'm not doing everything I can I thought I was I, as I said I kept thinking I was and and this year since the start of the year like my boss Tom Whitaker who's like the smartest like elitist coach I've ever sort of crossed paths with like the level of depth and knowledge he's got of everything not just his own sport, like any sport, he's just crazy. And he, and he keep, and he keeps and he like throughout this year, he said to me like, "What what have you changed? Like what have you changed? Because like we're seeing a different level. We're seeing a different level of output. We're doing a different level of input. Like we're seeing a different um, level of like, integration into all the different disciplines." And it was probably like it was probably just shortly after that time when I was just I, I was seeing how these because I'm still new in the elite athlete world and I've seen the Addis pro like experienced pros who've had longevity at the top and I was like and it almost flips a switch you know uh, mm. flip, <laughs> flipped a switch in my head and it was like and then for the last six months the process was was so was direct it was in depth uh, it was disciplined everything I'd done for this world championship I just competed at was bulletproof in a sense that I knew I was going into Dubai in my best possible shape and lo and behold it was uh, my best ever result competition and and yeah so that, uh, uh, going back to what you said there is definitely there is there's definitely still weight and in the original way of just getting things done success needs good principles it needs good process and um, and yeah, and that's why I remember looking at how AJ conducted himself in, in them environments, and it was top. Like it just going down to little things that at a certain time in the day he'd cut. He wouldn't have no photos with no one. Like before that, you see him taking photos of everyone. Like the, I, me myself, I'd get the um having to take the amount of photos he did. Do you know what I mean? So I'm glad I'm never going to be a heavyweight champion of the world, but. At certain times every day, boom, no one, this is me time now. I'm here to do a job. This is my job essentially. And yeah, and that's uh, and that's something I've learned off a lot of watching a lot of athletes. But yeah, I, I, as I go back to the question, I don't think I've got any idols, but I do like watching how sort of, even someone I've liked watching at West Ham over the years, Mark Noble, just 
how they operate, how they carry themselves, the how they build relationships, and 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 how yeah, and how they carry themselves in everywhere, not just what you see them in on the media, you know. Yeah, the um, Joshua. I remember watching a program. I think it was called AJ Off Limits, mm. and uh, it was done by Sky. I think it was this one. I've seen a few kind of mini documentaries on him and loads of different boxers and athletes. And I'm a bit like you that there isn't one person that I look at and say, I idolise that person, but there'll be bits from Conor McGregor I'll take into my mm. life. There's bits from AJ I'll take into my life. There's bits from loads of different people that you're kind of trying to take the best bits. And something I picked up with Joshua, he was going into like a cafeteria canteen and he handed over an avocado and I think they actually said we've got avocado he said no this is organic I want you to put that in my salad or whatever and it's them small one percenters two percenters that compounded over loads of different elements and di different dif disciplines in your field makes a massive amount of difference later on and it's like you said Drake said it one of his songs let the outcome be income and what I took from that is do the things that are going to give you the income from b becoming a professional. Mm. That's the outcome of it. Because everything you're doing is factoring in the end goal. It's factoring in to become the best version of you. And the best people in the world, including myself, you fall off every so often. And it takes conversations like this. It takes watching documentaries. It takes listening to a podcast to actually think, you know what? I've let myself down a few times there and I've made excuses, recognising them excuses and jumping back on. Mm. So I think it's so important. The Let's talk about your sport. So, uh, powerlifting, you're a powerlifter. Yeah, so I'm a yeah, power weightlifter, power yeah. powerlifter. Okay. Um, yeah, and it was just, because when, something I really struggled with, because obviously I was such a keen sportsman and, I played sports to a, like a really good level pre-injury. Um, so when I first had my injury and started going down to sports clubs, the first one I went to was wheelchair rugby. And my friend Sasha Pond uh, took me down. And she, and I remember pulling out, I've opened up down the side and I've just absolutely caned a uh, lad in his chair and he's gone flying out the chair. And I just, and I looked at her like, and I'm like, <sighs> just a bit like feeling a bit well I didn't I didn't like that and she's looked at me and she's just gone you're not enjoying this are you and I said nah and we just sort of slipped out and went like whilst the session was still going on because <coughs> I was looking for a replacement of the adrenaline like I love adrenaline I love being buzzing and I love getting after something but I just weren't getting that from from power sport so I'd almost made a conscious effort just to say, do you know what, I've given it a try and it ain't really for me. I, um, because I just had such a nailed in view of sport that, and it was different. It, not not any less amazing, but it just, well, I, it, rather than, because I'd gone from rugby, smashing into someone was my, like my buzz. Like that was probably what I was good at, the, the best at, just smashing people. And, um, we went into and then went into that and I was like it's just chairs smashing so I didn't get the same from it but anyway so then I, like, so I was like oh I'm not going to play sport and then um, a nurse from Salisbury Spinal Unit uh, Martin his name Martin Whitfield his name was was like the he was, he was a good he, at the first you're like god this geezer's an ass, but he was actually one of the most perfect nurses you could have because he made you do things yourself like so many of the others were like, oh, don't worry, love, I'll do it, I'll do it, boom, boom, boom. But he'd be like, no, get up and do it, go and do it yourself. And that was pucker for me because that, that again, that was another thing. But anyway, he rang me and said, we're taking a team to the Spinal Games. The Spinal Games is basically a mass, it's like a mini Olympics in terms of, it's everyone in a, there's about, I don't know, 50 spinal units up and down the country and they all bring people that have been injured within the last year to come and compete against each other in an aim to find an ex-Paralympian or show how you can still be active. And it, it, there was like people there from a plethora of different reasons and goals and out, and, it, and I said, oh yeah, I'll come down. So then I ended up doing like three or four sports across a week uh, one or more but I actually lost uh, I think it's called eight ball pull I lost that 
couldn't do that. It, it was uh, it was too slow for me, so I lost that that week. So I was a bit like didn't didn't expect to lose sort of thing. Um, and then so then yeah, and then I got to the Friday, and there was a there was a, f- a fella on my spine unit that was shouting off all week long, all week long. Oh, I'm stronger than you. I'm this and you that than you. Blah, 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 blah. Giving it a big, large all week. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, no problem, mate. No problem, no problem. And anyway, on the Friday, it was a weightlifting day. And um, he was meant to be doing it because he's been giving big licks all week. And I kept going, you sure you don't, like, you sure you don't mean it? Uh, I'm not saying I was, like, the strongest man back then, but I'd been in the gym and I, I just, I was like, I don't know if this key's going to Anyway, he pulls out just before it was meant to go on. And so I was like, sod it, I'll jump on, I'll do it. Ended up at a, obliterating it. Uh, I think I benched like 147 or something and I'd never, and I hadn't touched a gym in like the last year, year and a half. So I, had, so I went straight into that. And um, and he, uh, and then, yeah, and then I, I, I won it and it was, um, and I got talent ID'd by a British weightlifting, give him all my staff, all my data, blah, 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 blah. And anyway, three or four months passed and I ain't heard nothing. So I'm like, God, oh, Jesus, must have been someone better than me. They're like, why have they not given me a ring? And then I'm walking I'm back down Bournemouth. I've sort of completely forgot about it. And I get a shout from, from a chap called Ch- Stuart Martin, who worked at the uni originally, but now is um, quite a hard for British weightlifting. He's going, big man, big man. And I'm like, can't see anyone. And then I see him. And he's walking into the gym with another athlete from British weightlifting. And, and he said, why, like, why are you not getting back to us? I, was, I said, what do you mean? I said, no one's rang me. He said, yeah, we've, we've, we've sent you emails, rang you, everything. He was like, and he uh, showed, showed me the details of giving me. I gave him the wrong number and the wrong email. Oh. <laughs> like absolute, like an absolute tool. But and then, anyway, and that was the first, and then they was like, no, we definitely, we definitely want you. And then, yeah, it went from there. And that's how, that's how I got into it. So I've got here that uh, Power Lifting World Cup 2021, I think it was in Dubai. Yep. Um, and then you actually broke the British record. So breaking the British record, how did that make you feel? And what is the new record? Um, so the when I first started the sport, the record was 196. 196 uh, kilo. 196 kilos. That's heavy. It's heavy. Um... And then when I first broke it, I broke it at 205. And then the second time I broke it was at 220. And then last last Friday, I competed at the World Championships in Dubai and I broke it for the third time to set a new British record of 230 kilos. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, that is heavy. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I get... I got a message off um, a chap called Ali Jawad, who's probably the most decorated power powerlifter of of all time within the Paralympic se- section. Hopefully, uh, he won't mind me saying this, but hopefully, I'm going to blow him out of the water. But uh, until I do, he is the top dog. And he sent me a, t- a text the other day, um, saying, "Out of the entire population of the planet." I'm in zero point zero 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 one percent of the planet in benching two hundred and thirty kilos, and when I I knew obviously it was strong and it was a big number, but when I read that, I was like, Jesus, that makes you uh, feel very very good. Can I, like so, uh, I'm pretty rubbish at doing uh, bench press. I've got a, an injury from boxing in it, and I've never been that strong on chest anyway. Yeah, but. I do know that when I do it, even still now in the gym, I'm obviously got the legs down because it kind of gives me a bit of stability. Yeah. So, sorry for being naive, and I have yeah. seen videos, but like, how the hell does that work for you? Because you've got no stability there. I see they kind of strap you down. Yeah. Is that what that must have been weird for the first time when you're benching? Uh yeah, in a sense, like it is because you're just like because I, I have to do everything. So I'm paralyzed from just above my belly button. So like, um, uh, yeah, just above. So I do it with about probably less than a third of my body. Like, um, and but through that you got a balance. You got a so I usually balance through my back. I'll get all my balance through my scaps and my top half whilst. I'm benching and on my on the bar I'll, I've got the widest grip possible because 
I'm covering more of the bar, so it's uh, I, in a weird way, it's easier to balance it if I'm further out. Yeah, yeah further out. Yeah. You know what I mean, rather than being narrow. Um, but yeah, that would. But that's I get like when I put things on Instagram and and TikTok, like you get all like the you get the knuckleheads going. Oh, he's cheating. He's got his legs up. Oh, he's cheating. He's got his straps in. Oh, and you get I get all that stick. It's so common. <laughs> But the straps, I can categorically say, are doing absolutely zilch other than holding my legs from flailing around all the place. Um, so it's literally, yeah, from from like my pecs up, really, that's what I'm using to, to lift that to yeah. lift that sort of weight. Um, I've got here, Paralympics, you've got your sights on, yes. 2024. Yep. So you already represent Great Britain, GB. Yep. Um, why is entering the Paralympics 2024 such a big goal for you? <sighs> what a good question. Um, the, it, the reason why, and as well as personal glory and what else, but the, my biggest thing is, as I've got a, a thing I call the comeback, and it's, it's a notes page I've got in my... Um, in my phone and it, it's it's all these things that are going to come apart of the comeback and I think but the biggest thing that like I didn't I didn't start sport to go I want to be a Paralympian I started sports to go I'm going to push every single possible boundary I can push I'm going to absolutely obliterate fields for people that come after me that people have come before me to show them that it is possible and I actually conducted a study whilst I was um, whilst I was studying. <laughs> That's the word I was looking for. Mm. But I actually conducted a study whilst I was studying on does competing in sport aid psychological recovery post life changing injury? And I conducted this across an array of people and that had had different injuries, brain injuries, spinal injuries, loads of people. And the biggest thing I found that is that no, they'd, they'd had no one, they, there was no one to show them it was possible. There was no one that pushed these boundaries of these institutes that, uh, that I don't know, that aren't fully successful. They're not surprising different facilities for average people. Like I've, I've trained in the most incredible facilities money can buy at Loughborough University but for the for the grassroots so to speak of sport there was nothing there was no one showing them that there was a way and I actually try. I actually went hell for leather um, to qualify for Tokyo which would have been like three years post injury um, but in my sport you have to do a four year cycle to get to the games so I'd missed the first year so I couldn't actually go um, but my, yeah, my thing is just, I want to show people that anything is possible. And, and I don't know, people, people always say this, but as I said earlier, that I've been, I've been in say, parts of my life where I've been trapped in caves by depression, not wanting to be there. And if within six years I can turn that round and be on a top of one of the, uh, the biggest sporting events in the planet then if that shows some people do you know what you can do it like it's, you'll be all right then uh, then that's a that's a career well done for me um we spoke a little bit off air the probably the main reason why you're actually here and why we're speaking is because of a mutual friend a guy called Lee May who I've got a lot of time for he's always given given the business and me boxing a lot of time a lot of support I mean even podcasts he's in, introduced me to a few people including your good self and I didn't realise this but you were actually a friend of his of his of his son um, your motivation like yeah. What, what what is your biggest motivation? Where where does that come from? Um, so yeah, as I, I've, I've, everyone, I mean, I've known Lee and Kane for years and years, but every single person that comes into my life, whether that's my uni mates, whether it's new friends from my my sport, my job, or whatever it is, everyone always knows about Kane. It's one of the first things I tell them about. 
because he is such a huge pillar in my life still to this day, even though he, he's been gone some time now. Um, and uh, it's, it's every day I think about him and, and I think about the incredible stories we've got together. And But it's also, I feel like my biggest motivation and inspiration is I got a second chance that he didn't get. And what I mean by that is when I had my injury, one, it could have killed me. Two, I could have killed myself as a result of it. But something that's always been in my head is that this is a second chance. This is my, my life back then. I mean, I guess it's glossing it in the way that makes it sound more positive but my life back then was at a stalemate I weren't doing much I was getting into trouble I was re weren't really doing much good and I had my injury and now I'm living a life that I could have never thought I'd have had then in terms of what I'm doing in elite sport travelling the world competing and he is still every day such a vivid picture in my mind because this is my second chance and he didn't get one and I remember it, finding out the day, it broke me back then. I remember everything, so many stories when we was going up together and there are the times that I think about when, when things get harder. I said to you earlier about the story when we was in um, <laughs> we was in Lee's house and Kane was always so small compared to me and he was fleeting around the loft and he's gone boom, 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 like across the deck, like a little, like, like a timid rat, like so, so light-footed and nimble across this, floor but ceiling of, and then I've gone being like double the size of him I've gone boom 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 across the same thing like, and I've gone straight through the ceiling and because his house was quite big it was like it's probably about a 10 15 foot drop and I've dropped and just remember clattering into the floor and I looked up and he's just like staring through the hole I've made like <laughs> looking down on me and it's just like them incredible stories that I constantly think about like it, it, and but even uh, anyone that knows anyone that knew Lee and Kane's relationship and how tight they was like whenever you was out or whatever then someone Kane mouthing off with someone it was always like oh let's get our dads down here and we'll see what happens like and it, and it was just their break their bond was unbreakable so even though I need no more inspiration than Kane like just looking next door to his dad and how he got because Kane was his right arm probably if you ask Lee he'd rather lose his anything in his butt, like his right arm he's, he'd give anything to have him back so like it was almost like seeing and Lee is one of the most successful men I know so it's almost like if he got through that, and if I've watched him get over that, where he's lost his, he's lost his boy. Um, as much as hard as it was for me losing such a close friend, I can't imagine how hard that was. So it's like, how if I remember when, and as I said earlier as well, and when I was sat in the hospital, I got a phone call off Lee, um, and uh, that was another really vivid memory I've got in my recovery because I remember sitting there going, how dare I think about giving up? How dare I think about taking the easy way out of this? Like, and that was almost when it was like, no, nah, that's not happening on my watch. It's not gonna happen today. Like, we're gonna smash this thing to pieces just like we have everything else. And yeah, and it, it, it still is today. Like, I went to the Commonwealth Games last year and the, the, the slogan for the competition was who, like bring it home and I've done an interview and one of the questions was who do you want to bring it home for and my first first thing that popped into my mind was Kane and it was just like I'm lucky I'm lucky to be I'm, I'm lucky to get the second chance in life and and some will say a better chance than the first crack I had here do you know so yeah he's um I'll never stop speaking about him. I'll never stop being inspired by him, and I'll never, ever, ever forget him. And it is, it's uh, as much as it was one of the worst things I've ever had to go through. Is I've got an inspiration, I've got a reason, and I've got a why that far outweighs a lot of other people's. And um, 
bar your your competing and, and representing the country and also smashing these records and going you know heading towards the the paralympics 2024 you also have been taken up public speaking obviously you've done a few podcasts now but the public speaking why is that outlet stimulating you and why is it such an important part of your profile today um because like i feel like um i'm good at building relationships with people but more importantly i want to show people because no matter what you're going through in a way i'll be able to relate to it because whether it's and i want to show people that because it's almost become fashionable to be weak and it's become I had a liars to not want to be the best, not want to succeed, not want to get up and go and get it. And I want to show people that no matter what happens, no matter what you're faced with in this life, you, we've, got a, we've got a saying at GB is the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes a way. And I've always thought like that, but I didn't know that, that phase until I got that quote until I got onto the world class program but that's that's the the quote of the world class program up in at Great Britain and it's show people that, that with with an, with an unrelenting want to be better do better and achieve you can and it's almost like I want to show people that it's it's okay like I think one of my big things is emotions like people in this current day and age of lost sight that you can be sad, happy, angry without being depressed, anxious or, and it, there's such a drive to label things but I want to show people that actually taking control of your own thoughts, your own feelings and trying to put it into something that's bigger, that that is that is inspired by the reason why you do things and, and I think that is for me, it's just like, just just to show people there there is a still a beauty in being strong being tough being getting up and going again and and never die, say die attitude you know and and if I can do that and I've been given an incredible platform uh, today and but I'd love to I'd love to do that in 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 podcasts in dinner events in, in anything really I feel like I've got a gift I've got a, I've been able to talk well and I feel like I've got a story that that people can take inspiration from and and as long as I can help and I can do things like that then why shouldn't I the comeback story is very much underway we can see that you know your personality you know smashing records public speaking etc so my last part I want to ask you to round off this this interview is what next Liam like what else is going to happen in the next five ten years what, what goals have you got I know we've spoken about Paralympics and stuff but what is next for you? What is next? So as well as obviously the the sporting goals is I I will be a Paralympic champion. There's no doubt about that. There's no there's not one fiber of my mind that doubts that. Um, don't get me wrong. I have done in the past, but right like now is I've got the process. I've got the team to be able to achieve that. But outside of that, I just want to I want to break down barriers. And I want to I want to do that for using my voice for using my sound. But also I want to become a I want to be I want to become a household name on on in the motivational speaking circuit. On I'm trying to build my social platforms at the minute, but I want to inspire change because you know there's not especially in the, the I don't like the word and I don't call myself it, but in the disabled influencer community there's no one for me it's people creating problems because it's like it's like this whole thing at the minute minute where they're trying to make uh they're trying to call people that haven't got any impairments non-disabled and it's just crazy like i feel like there needs to be a sane person in this space going Yes, we need to do everything we can to make it equal opportunity or whatever, but also like the world's not built for us. And and as long as we're seeing change and it's going like that, like, because I see, uh, there's another thing I see on the other day is like pity or Paralympics. And it was basically like they're saying that aspiring to the Paralympics is not like a, 
a good thing to do and it was just like and it was just I was sitting there going it's crazy and it, like people should be idolised by getting used with their new life and things like that but then I'm sitting there reading it going hang on a minute I'm doing that as well as becoming a Paralympian hopefully <laughs> so yeah I think that, that 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 would be if I can inspire some form of change and be a household name in the public speaking sectors that that concern me and the the dinner circuits then I think yeah that would be a a good five or ten years just to, to establish myself in a in two different fields this is my last question when I um I've got my own catchphrase my own mantra my own incantation my own whatever you want to call it um and it goes like this be happy never content now i've got my own interpretation of what that means but if i were to ask liam mcgarry what does what does be happy never content actually mean for you be happy never content um i feel like just taking it as face value not really having much thought about it I feel like that perfectly embeds me um, because I don't think there's ever a room where you can't laugh in and I'm never content with where I am right now and that my interpretation of that is be like because I've got a thing where I say la laughing at bad times don't make you a bad person and uh, and it don't, it gets me in trouble from now and then laughing at certain situations. But I think laughter's like, be like the, most, one of the most beautiful things in the world and it definitely got me through my injury, just laughing and having people laugh at me like I'm doing something in a wheelchair and they're like, do you know what I mean? It's like, so I think that's what I say, be happy is just, when I think of happy, I think of laughter and I think uh, as long as you're laughing then you're doing all right. And yeah, and the can, never content is, don't stand still. I feel like in a world where it's easy to stand still and become content and happy and comfortable just plodding on day to day, I, I feel like that means, yeah, never stand still. Keep keep aspiring to be better, to conduct yourself better, to train better in, in my circumstances. And yeah, and, and just being that, that bit better every single day. And um, like you said earlier, it comes down to the 1% and if you're putting more one percents together than you, the people around you, then then you're doing all right. Yeah, honestly, mate, it's been a very very good conversation, really good episode. I'm inspired. I can't wait to listen to it back. I can't wait for it to get out there, and I'm looking forward to seeing how your journey develops. And um, yeah, positive, you larger in life sort of personality, character, and I've got no doubt you're going to smash every single goal. So thank you very much for sharing your journey, and we'll do a part two once you've. Uh, Smashed the Paralympic Olympic Games in 2024. Yes, mate. Thank you for having me on. Um, yeah, glad you've enjoyed it. I hope your viewers enjoy it. And uh, yeah, hopefully they're uh, egging you on to get me back. Yeah. <laughs> Be happy, never content. Make sure you're subscribing to the channel and follow Liam's journey. Um, last note, actually, where can they find you? Uh, so my in Instagram is my main channel, which is underscore Liam8. Um, and I've just started TikTok with strength and adversity, but uh, yeah, we're not off the ground with that one yet, really. But uh, yeah, the main one is underscore Liam8. Um, that's where I'll post two or three times a week. All right, top man. All right, thank you very much. Be happy, never content, and uh, looking forward to, uh, to, to to speaking to you a bit further as, as, as the weeks and months go by, mate. All right. Thank you very God much. Bless. Cheers, mate. Guys. Before we end this episode, I have to give one more mention to this week's sponsors, iSecure Vehicles. Now, I've already mentioned their products. They are the very best in what they do. They have a wide range of different services and different systems to protect your asset and your vehicle. Head over to their website to find out a bit more. Thanks for watching this week's episode. There's gonna be some more exciting guests, some big names, and some really, really juicy episodes.